Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here. This time around, I'm going to give you a first look review at the new Nikon 180-600mm to zoom exclusively for the Z-Series cameras. I've talked to Nikon numerous times about how excited my viewers and subscribers are for this particular lens, so they asked me if I wanted to take it for a very quick test drive before launch. You know, naturally I said yes, and I'm very excited to share what I've learned so far. Also, I wanted to really thank Nikon and my rep for allowing me to do this. I was actually traveling in Colorado at the time and they really went out of their way to bring the lens out to my location so I could have a little time with it and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Also, I do want to emphasize that this is a very quick, very early test with a pre-production lens and I only had access to the lens for a handful of hours. The Nikon rep literally flew in and flew out the same day, so our time was incredibly short. In that time, we needed to go over the lens, find wildlife subjects, which proved somewhat difficult at times, shoot B-roll and more, all while battling very challenging light most of our time. It was a tough whirlwind day for sure, but I did what I could in the time that I had. I'll likely do some more in-depth tests later, so hit the subscribe button to make sure you see those. Also, because this was a pre-production lens, there technically may be slight differences between it and the finalized version. As such, I was not allowed to do any direct comparison tests, so those will have to come later, including a sharpness test and comparison against the Sony 200-600. As always, I was not paid or compensated in any way for this review, and all the travel expenses were mine. I want to remain neutral, so I continue to pay my own way for any and all reviews you see from me. With that in mind, here's what I found so far. Price. I'm not going to bury the lead here. The price of this lens is $1699.95 and should start shipping sometime in August. It's basically the mirrorless replacement for the 200 to 500. I wanted to mention this first so you can sort of keep things in perspective. This lens is not going to have all the features and functions of something like the 600TC. After all, it costs about 11% of the price of a 600TC. However, I do think it covers the essentials well enough to keep most shooters very happy. Let's take a look. Build in features. Build quality feels rugged and seems a solid step above the old 200-500. Like most Z-series lenses, it seems like it's well-made and feels solid in the hand. Although it isn't an S-series lens, the controls still have a solid precision feel to them that's on par with other Z-series lenses I've used. I'd certainly not hesitate to use this weather-sealed lens under the same conditions I subject my other gear to, including rain, dust, and general abuse in the field. I'm sure my copy of the lens will see time here in the U.S. as well as in Africa and Costa Rica, and I'm confident it can handle all the rigors and abuse it will receive from me on those trips. For the most part, I thought the overall quality was very good, especially considering the price point. As for internals, the lens has 25 elements in 17 groups, including 6 extra low dispersion elements, an aspherical element, as well as a flooring coating on the front element to help repel dust and moisture. The aperture consists of 9 blades and the maximum wide open f-stop floats between f5.6 on the wide end and f6.3 on the long end. When it comes to the buttons, controls, and switches on the lens, they are a bit sparse compared to other Nikon telephotos. However, again, you have to keep in mind the price point. The good news is that the controls that are present have a rugged, durable feel to them. The lens itself has a control slash focus ring that, by default, will act as a focus ring for this lens, even if you already have your control ring settings adjusted for another function. You can still go in and set the control ring for something other than focus, like exposure compensation or ISO if you like, but out of the box, it'll work as a focus ring. That said, in the field, I used the ring as a focus ring, the default, since one of my field strategies is manually focusing the lens and getting it close before engaging AF. There are also times that the camera may hunt, and having a quick manual focus override to get things back in the ballpark is very handy. The ring itself has a good tactile feel, and the texture makes it easy to find with your eye to the viewfinder, and I really like the placement in conjunction with the zoom ring. 
the lens uses an internal short throw zoom that's a huge improvement over the 200 to 500. It's just 70 degrees from 180 millimeter to 600 millimeter and turns with exactly the right amount of dampening. They really did a good job here. If you had a 200 to 500, you recall that the zoom ring was just about impossible to turn from 200 to 500 without removing your hand for a second or even third crank of the zoom ring. This is a vast improvement and makes jumping between focal lengths far more efficient in the field. In addition, the 200 to 500 was not an internal zoom. So as you adjusted the focal length, the lens changed size, upsetting the balance if you were using it on a gimbal head. The 180 to 600's internal zoom causes no such issues and balanced well with a Z8 on a gimbal. And of course, you don't have to worry about sucking in extra dust or moisture with an internal zoom lens either. The lens also features a programmable lens function button. Okay, technically there are four buttons in total, but they all act as a single lens function button. In short, whatever you program to your lens function button in the camera applies to all four buttons that run around that front part of the lens. The idea is that no matter how you're holding the lens, you'll have a lens function button at your fingertips. The lens also includes a dedicated AF slash MF button for quickly switching between manual and autofocus, as well as a range limiter. The range limiter allows you to use the entire focus range of the lens or limit the focus range to between infinity and six meters. This can cut acquisition time down if the camera misses a lock and starts to hunt since it can only take that hunting trip through a limited area of the focus range. And as a side note, I find this incredibly handy for bird and flight work. Still, I do wish Nikon would have followed Sony's example here and also included a short range limiter. They really are handy for closer work with smaller animals. Both switches snap into place with a satisfying click and seem like they are built with reliability in mind. Overall, I think the controls are adequate considering the price point. Still, it wouldn't have hurt my feelings if Nikon had included separate focus and control rings, as well as a lens function two button. The problem is, when you're programming your camera and lens buttons, it's tough when some are present on one lens, but absent from another. It forces you to duplicate their functions on the camera in case you have a lens attached that doesn't support a function you assign to a missing button or control. Again though, we have to keep in mind that this lens is designed for quality results at an affordable price. And to be fair, the features do compete well with other lenses in this class. As for size and weight, the lens weighs 4.71 pounds with a tripod collar or 2140 grams. The lens is well balanced and feels like it was built for hand holding and that's how I used it the entire time. The placement of the zoom ring and control slash focus ring were just right and were very easy to manage in the field with my eye to the viewfinder. As a comparison, the Sony 200 to 600 weighs about the same, coming in just a hair lighter at 4.66 pounds or 2115 grams. Note that you can go a bit lighter with a Nikon by removing the collar, dropping it to 4.3 pounds or 1955 grams. Regardless, this is a nice improvement in weight over the 200 to 500, which came in at just a smidgen over five pounds or 2,300 grams. From a size perspective, this lens is 12.5 inches long and 4.4 inches at its widest, which is pretty much the same size as the Sony 200 to 600. It's a very manageable size for travel and fits easily into a typical camera bag, even with the camera attached. I also really like the lens hood. It works like the one the 800 PF has, twisting into place and engaging with a little locking mechanism, effectively preventing it from detaching. To release, press the locking switch and twist. In the field, I found I like this better than the Sony's 200 to 600 hood attachment system, which consistently causes frustration when attaching or detaching. In fact, it kind of drives me nuts. The lens's minimum focus distance varies based on focal length, and I've put those numbers here in this slide. It also boasts a 0.25x reproduction ratio. It's not quite a macro, but it really allows you to get in close and fill the frame in a way you can't with a dedicated prime like a 600F4, which has a 0.14x reproduction ratio at 600 millimeter. In fact, this is one of the reasons why I like having one of these types of lenses in the bag, since I often deal with small, close range targets that are nearer than the 14 foot minimum focus distance of my 600 f4. Plus the superior reproduction ratio means that at minimum focus distance, my subject is actually larger in the frame. 
Finally, the lens collar and foot. This seems about on par with other lenses at this price point. It's adequate, and I like it better than the one I remember on the 200 to 500, but it's certainly not at the same level as the ones found on Nikon's higher end optics. Now, I also think Sony's 200 to 600's collar is a little bit more robust, although the Sony collar can't be removed and the Nikon one can. As usual, no Arcus was dovetail is included, so I'll likely replace it with a third party collar when they become available. Still, it did make a good handle when carrying it in the field. Autofocus VR sharpness and rendering impressions. Before we begin, I wanted to quickly mention that if you want to get the most from your Z8 or Z9, make sure you grab my setup guide. It's geared towards wildlife photographers, but readers tell me the advice works well for quite a few different genres. Plus, it will soon be updated for the new Z9 4.0 firmware. The book covers how I set each of my menus for my wildlife work, why I set them the way I do, and how I leverage those settings in the field. It's a must-have for Z8 and Z9 wildlife shooters. Make sure you check it out. Swinging back to the topic at hand, I need to mention that since the lens I was using was a pre-production model, I wasn't allowed to comparatively test things like AF speed, VR performance, sharpness, or background rendering against other glass. However, I am allowed to pass along my impressions, so that'll have to do for now. Later, once I have my production copy, I'll probably do a follow-up to this first look review that will include more detailed information. As a side note, although the lens works with a 1.4 and 2X TCs, I didn't have a chance to test those combinations since I wasn't too eager to face F9 or F13 apertures, so that'll have to come later as well. Let's start with autofocus speed, with emphasis on the fact that I couldn't do any real control testing. The 180-600 uses Nikon's STM motors, stepping motors, and definitely seems faster than the 200-500. My seat of the pants estimate is that it's on par with the Sony 200-600 for autofocus speed. My impression was that, while it's not the fastest focusing lens I've ever used, it was quick enough. I'm confident it has the speed to handle pretty much any situation I'd use it for. Yes, even birds in flight. I'll do some speed tests and comparisons once I have my production copy, though. As for VR, it was impressive with the wildlife shots, but I wanted to see how it did at really slow shutter speeds. Nikon claims 5.5 stops of VR stabilization, so let's see. Since our time was limited, at the end of the day, I found just a road sign and decided to try a few slower shutter speeds, just hand-holding the lens at 600 millimeter without any kind of extra support and not braced against a tree or post or anything. Also, Keep in mind that I'm not the steadiest at hand holding, and this was done at the end of a rather exhausting day. I started at 1 60th and had just over 50% of my shots at what I would consider acceptably sharp, which for me is impressive. So I dropped to 1 30th and dropped to about one third of my shots falling into the acceptably sharp range. At 1 15th, it was only about 10%, but hand holding a 600 millimeter and getting anything sharp at 1 15th is basically a miracle for me. By the way, my tests were with VR Sport. I found that VR Normal is usually a little bit better, but since I usually shoot Sport, that's what I used here. I'll take a closer look with a production lens using both Sport and Normal in the future. Also, remember that everyone's ability to handhold is different. You may do better or worse than I did. Overall, I think the VR system was very impressive and seemed, at least to me, superior to the one in the 200 to 500, which I always thought was quite good. Well, what about sharpness? The truth is, I really want to compare this lens to other known performers, but since it was a pre-production model, all I could give you are my impressions. Overall, the lens seemed on par with what I saw with my 200 to 500, which is to say very good. It also seems like it should be able to compete head to head with the Sony 200 to 600 for sharpness. While I don't think it's gonna beat out my 600 TC when I do a formal sharpness test, it seemed very good wide open, and I'm very happy with what I saw. I'd certainly use it professionally when I needed a zoom lens. Still, I will be conducting some sharpness tests, so let me know in the comments which lenses you would be interested in seeing tested against this one, and make sure you subscribe to see the results. In fact, Take a look at this marmot at 100%. Not only do we see impressive detail in the fur, but if you look at the skin around the orbital ring, you can see each little indentation by the eye. In addition, if you look into his eye, you can see the cloud formations that were present when I snapped the shutter. So to me, sharpness looks pretty good. What about overall rendering? Now, overall, I was happy with the way the lens rendered. Contrast and color seemed on par with my Sony 200-600 and the Nikon 200-500 and other lenses at this price point. 
Background rendering looked natural to me in the limited photos I was able to capture with smooth transitions between the in-focus and out-of-focus areas. The biggest trick is avoiding busier, closer range backgrounds since the lens is limited to f5.6 to f6.3 on the wide open end. Still, if you exercise, care can work well. Overall, I didn't see anything that seemed like oddly busy or objectionable in my out-of-focus areas, even with VR engaged. The backgrounds looked about like what I would expect at the apertures I was using. Naturally, everyone has different criteria for what they think a background should look like, so it's probably best to pause the sample photos in this video to get a better impression. F6.3 at 600 millimeter. One question that always comes up is why super zooms like this are always f6.3 on the long end and not f5.6 or even faster. Well, I asked my rep about it and it basically comes down to keeping the size, weight, and price reasonable. Going to f5.6 increases all of the above. f6.3 seems to hit the sweet spot for the target audience. Of course, slower maximum f-stops can present challenges in the field when it comes to keeping the background out of focus and creating separation in our images. However, I have found that careful composition can work wonders. The biggest tricks are doing your best to leverage distant backgrounds and keeping to eye level with your subjects whenever possible. Both help create separation and can make it feel like you're using a much faster lens than you really are. I have a video on 3D Pop you might want to look at for more tips. As for ISO, keep in mind that f6.3 is only a third of a stop slower than 5.6. The VR system in this lens should make it easy to use a little bit slower shutter speed to overcome any ISO issues, at least for movement on your end. Handling and versatility. While affordability is likely going to win the crown for this lens's greatest strength, I think that handling and versatility are the features you'll really enjoy once the credit card is paid off. The lens itself is really well balanced and easy to handle. I used it with the Z8, a combination that seems like it will prove very popular. In fact, I have a feeling that this lens was made with the Z8 in mind, although I'm sure the 180-600 to will be happy mounted to any Z-series camera you have. The overall size and weight of the Z8 with the 180-600 to is very manageable and easy, heck, even fun, to handhold. The balance seems to keep fatigue at bay, and I was able to keep the camera to my eye for long periods without issue. Naturally, your mileage will vary when it comes to handholding, but overall, I was impressed. Couple that with a fantastic VR system, and you have a lens that seems like it was built with handholding in mind. The size also makes it very easy to use in tighter situations, situations that prove more than a little challenging for larger glass. Often, the best shots are captured when you can smoothly and quietly maneuver into position without causing a lot of critter-terrifying ruckus on your way there. A smaller lens like this definitely pushes the odds in your favor. Of course, then there's the zoom. As a prime shooter, I don't like to admit it, but there are times a zoom can save the day. In fact, on my last Africa trip when I was shooting Sony, I had a prime on one camera and the 200 to 600 on another. That combo was potent to say the least, and I'm 100% confident that I would have missed many of my favorite shots from that trip without access to the zoom. The truth is that although primes will generally offer faster maximum f-stops, better across the frame sharpness, and superior rendering, there are plenty of times that none of that is more important than the ability to quickly zoom to a different focal length. I can't tell you the number of times I've been shooting side by side with someone using a zoom lens while I used a prime and they got the shot because I couldn't zoom out and I had nowhere to go. Overall, between the size, weight, and balance, I found the lens incredibly versatile and nimble in the field, and I'm confident it will work well for many shooters. The truth is, sometimes versatility and flexibility are what win the day, and this lens delivers them in spades. So, who should get this lens? I think there are three categories of people who should consider this lens. First are those people who simply can't justify the expense of one of the bigger primes, or even the 800PF or 400 4.5. For many people, wildlife photography is just a hobby, and shelling out thousands of dollars just isn't feasible. This no-frills lens delivers where it counts the most, delivering sharp images in a versatile, handholdable package. The second group who may want to consider a lens like this are those who simply can't handle large glass. Maybe you can afford or justify a big prime, but 
They are too much to manage. This lens is very hand holdable for most people and easy to carry. However, to this group, I'd also point out the 400 4.5. It's even lighter and takes TCs incredibly well. Not as versatile, but if weight is an issue, it should be on your short list too. The third group is people like me. Maybe you have and use big primes without issue, but find there are times that a zoom is indispensable. I know I run into that frequently, especially in situations where I'm in a fixed position or in a position where I can't reposition myself rapidly enough and the animal is moving. Sometimes you just need a zoom lens. I'm also planning to use this lens for much of my small animal pursuits. The close focus distance and zoom flexibility are very valuable when working nose to nose with small birds, mammals, and reptiles slash amphibians. And a lens like this allows me to work in a much more flexible way than a prime does. Sort of a pick the right tool for the job situation. Conclusion. So for me, between the zoom, the VR system, the sharpness, the handhold ability, and of course, the price, this lens really delivers some serious bang for the buck. I know I'm gonna get one for sure, I just have way too many uses for it not to. Plus, I'm confident making that statement since I found myself using the Sony 200-600 quite a bit more than I expected since getting it. This is the Nikon equivalent, so I'm sure I'll find myself using it in much the same way. Even though I have several world-class primes, there are times you just need a zoom lens to get the shot, and I'd use this one without hesitation. Overall, despite a few shortcomings, I think Nikon did a really great job here, especially considering the price point. I have no doubt this will turn out to be one of their most popular wildlife lenses ever and is going to put a smile on the face of countless wildlife shooters. It's a vast improvement over the 200 to 500 and addresses all of its shortcomings at an incredibly affordable price. Every Z series wildlife shooter should give this lens some serious consideration. Also, in my opinion, this lens solidifies my feeling that Nikon really does have the best lens lineup for wildlife shooters at this time. Also, if you want to get the most from the AF system in your Z series cameras, make sure you check out my book, Secrets to the Nikon Autofocus System Mirrorless Edition. It covers the Z8, Z9, Z50, and the Z5, 6, and 7 series. The AF systems in these cameras is complex, and to get the most out of your camera, you really need to understand how it all works, and this book will explain it in fun, easy to understand language. Check it out. It's the fastest path to consistently tack sharp photos. And of course, if you're a Z8 or Z9 shooter, remember to check out my Z8 slash Z9 wildlife setup guide. It's a must have if you wanna get the most from your camera. As always, thanks so much for watching and remember to share this video with your friends. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.